All right, everybody. Welcome to Tuesday. This is July 11 right now. Our next OSE developers meeting. Please take a look at the working document, which is. Let me paste that since. Uh, okay, that's the current working document. So please take a look at that. Uh, the agenda is very basic. Let me uh, share my screen also. Okay. Uh, let me zoom this in a little bit. Okay. Here we go. So here's the uh, current progress in terms of developer developer hours and and uh, contributors. So so we're hovering around like 150 hours per week, which is a good start. Uh, our numbers ha are hovering about like eight eight logged co contributions per week uh, from the official developer team. Out of the, an official like we've got like 18 people on an official team, so. Um, kind of got to get those numbers in, in sync but we do have two new developers Antonio and Alejandro so two people will be joining the team so timeline progress report critical path um, and progress reports during this meeting so this is where we are right now uh, you can click a link for that critical path right now the one thing that we're gonna add to the to the development these are all the things that are actually going on in the background on different things but we do want to add a tractor team that that will be a um, big um, big new new thing we haven't done work on a tractor this this year so far uh, but there's the new people as well as some of the people from Saudi Arabia as well as some old developers we're gonna do that because uh, September we are planning on building in the next iteration of the tractor as far as this this critical path right here only goes up to uh, the brick press workshop which is August 25th so uh, that's the last last part right here CB power cube build workshop okay that's the 25th we're gonna get that announcement out pretty soon so workshops announcements are here 3D printer announcement that we have to get out by this Saturday. So the, the workshop will be August 12th. That's right here at Factory Farm. And that means from this Saturday, that's exactly four weeks to that workshop. So that's, uh, that's the kind of timing we want to give people four weeks to sign up for the workshop. Um, so... I'm developing the production capacity. Go to slide four. That's that's uh, recent recent work from on site right here. So I've got a total of seven uh, printers built at this point. Uh, two of them have been tested. Five more have to get all the testing testing on them and all that. But that's late last night. Uh, print cluster so that we can effectively print parts for the next workshop like last time I had two printers going those were the Lulzbot minis and it took about two weeks to print just pretty much going constantly as much as I could it took two weeks to print parts for 12 printers in the last workshop now if we're gonna try to get uh, more people signed up I mean the goal ideally I'd like to have 24 people sign up uh, then we need a little more production power so that we're not pressed for time in terms of printing so with seven 3d printers that should be um, I mean right now seven I, I've got actually three more frames that I could build up but uh, parts for the workshop as well as for the CNC torch table which get to be much bigger parts so so we need this and this is really good and with Christian we are actually gonna meet we're planning on meeting after uh, this meeting to to discuss the print cluster as far as the software, the Raspberry Pi, uh, getting these connected so that w one single computer controls it through a Raspberry Pi. So that would be a great thing. And, and at this point, we can be talking about 
you know, actually selling parts like kits for the 3D printers or or the CNC circuit mills or whatever, we can be uh, using these to produce more more parts and do a web. I mean, I, I'd like to see a web front where we develop the whole process, the whole here's how you build your printers, here's how you run the software, here's how you run a website, a sales website where you can actually print parts. I mean, I can tell you that. Uh, for us, there's definitely a lot of a lot of uses like saving our saving ourselves trips to the store when we need plumbing fittings. Like right now, we're working on a on a seed eco home, and we always need some kind of a fitting. But I mean, that's the kind of stuff that we can replace pretty much completely. Like if you talk about house building, so I mean, very practical, uh, and making parts for for kits for for more printers. So getting in a full open source infrastructure for for a print cluster, including things like people can actually log into our computer and use our printer remotely. I mean, is that possible? Certainly, it could be possible. So, for example, one scenario would be where we where we just keep several printers, how many we want, um, possibly with a video camera, and and you just order print time. And then we can perhaps ship the parts out to people. So. That's that's an interesting proposition. I think one of the challenges is how do you know print parts are going to print well? I'm thinking that to address that issue is we have a, a storefront of accepted parts. Parts that people select from a menu and that would assure that the prints are perfected because we know how to print them well and all the settings are correct and so forth. Or they're just designed properly so they are very easy to print. But very exciting. I mean, this is this is really nice. Just to tell you a little bit about this build. I mean, it took a bit, like all of last week. I actually spent building the 13-inch th version. That that one back there is the complete one. You can see here how I'm kind of fitting all the wires, some of the last steps into the cable chain. But uh, it took a whole week, and then just one day, pretty much, to build five more. Because once everything, like all the dimensions are proper, like all the little details of how, you know, how you do the cable routing, like for example, having to do the cable routing and then redoing it or refitting some parts, etc. Uh, that took the time. But right now the machine is, stands at 7.5 or 7 by 8 inch build platform and 7.5 inches tall. And that's using the 13 inch frame. So that's very nice. A nice uh, big build volume, heated bed. Um, everything is working. Like all the parts here that you see have been printed with the the 16-inch 3D printer that I built here. So the D3D 16-inch version. And once all the parts are assembled, it's really nice. Like a good production line would work very very well. What I did was prepare all the ca all the printed parts, the the axes. Put the motors on them, so X, Y, Z axes. Prepared the whole uh, extruder assembly. That's kind of a, like a big job. A bunch of little pieces there. Then the whole print bed assembly. And then once once I had that, once uh, once I started putting the things on the frames, it literally took like two hours to put all those pieces onto to make like from from finished frames and from finished assemblies. It took like five uh, like two hours about to assemble. Uh, five of these printers. So that's, I mean, it's pretty amazing. Uh, I think the the workflow could work really well where instead of each person doing, going through the whole build, we, we build in teams. So each team has a module and people can switch between teams, but that, that workflow of kind of like a production line works really, really well because then at the end you, you assemble it very, very rapidly. And once again, the trick is like the orientation of axes, like how the belt is attached. Um, and I'll go to the next slide here. You can look at this video if you go to view present mode. But here, actually, Shane, who who did the we did the CNC circuit mill, which is what you see here with a spindle. Uh, he shows how to tension the belt. But the the concept is whether you attach the belt in the upper or bottom hole means that the the 3D printer, the axis, would be moving in opposite directions depending on where you attach it. So that kind of um, that part is the most tricky part about the entire process. Like when you build the entire machine, you really want to build it once. So 
in the build here, I had the one machine right in front of me, and I modeled all the parts. Uh, orientations, it's really about orientations. Because I can tell you from last workshop, people on average built the 3D printer like three times, meaning they did it, it wasn't the correct orientation, so they had to flip things and so forth. And then, of course, you can fix that in software, but then everyone would be running different software, and we wanted to say, okay, the software is going to remain the same, fix the physical structure so that everything is, is turnkey upon further down the road. So um, it works having one model and then assembling everything where you're looking at the orientations. The orientations are, are rather tricky because even myself, when I was looking at, you know, I'm making five axes, there's five printers, I'm making five axes, and you have to pay attention to a few details, like which side is the motor attached to, which side is the belt attached to, which side are the, the tops of the bolts, um, because then it makes it easy to take the bolts out, etc. Uh, so yeah, just little details, but definitely uh, uh, definitely tricky. I, now I understand why everyone ma built the 3D printer three times, because uh, it's actually a lot of detail. So I think a workflow where you have a whole team working on modules and there's quality control because the, when you're making a whole load of modules you can quality control at the point that they're being made so you don't have to go to one person then another person all the modules are right there and you can look at one and then you can look at all of them to see if they're identical and that way you know you're right so that kind of quality control would be much much simpler to do because you're going through a whole set of the modules at the same time so that's just some notes on the build uh, okay, moving on here, so that's the the current work on the on a CNC circuit mill is that Shane has uh, is working on um, refining the circuit mill to get really nice uh, circuit milling so we can make our own circuits for everything like controllers and everything. But um, they're actually considering writing a small paper on the characterizing the backlash and all the motion characteristics of the of the universal access system so that's that's really good uh, this stuff is spreading to other places and I do really like the axis it's it's very flexible I do think it's gonna be become widely used in various contexts because it's a construction set okay uh, next uh, we'll go to Lyman filament extruder so as you see it it's coming together so uh, the thing is about 3D printing, the most expensive part is filament, so we're going to make our own filament. So this is part of the filament extruder. If you go to um, Lyman Filament Extruder page on the wiki, you can see see this work. This is the part library. Thank you, Roberto, for doing that. You, he's assembling a lot of different parts. Um, these are large, a lot of 3D printed parts. There's some metal parts here. I'm seeing that Will's doing different parts here. I'm seeing Roberto doing that. I'm seeing Abe pulling in some parts. Uh, so that's really good. It's coming along together. Uh, so, so quite good. And then just the last thing on updates is uh, we're working on a new. So Joseph is who's contacted you. We're working on a new developer invitation video just to update people with the, the latest progress and make a more compelling video. And we're looking at at creating a the application process would be a video cover letter instead of an uh, interview. So once once the person uh, the interview prior to the FreeCAD exam, uh, it would be a video cover letter. So basically, answer all the questions that uh, are in the interview through a little video. So that. That takes um, that would be much less work on our part. It would put the more burden on the applicant. But if you, I'm, I'm keeping detailed numbers, and the fact right now is, uh, it takes me five hours to get one person on the team, one active developer. Wow, that's a lot of time actually. So I'm kind of getting tired of it. I really need help, and I think part of the. Um, Part of this can be simplified by a simple cover letter, intro, like video, eliminating the interview so that we get people on faster. But that's the facts. I mean, one in three end up actually doing the test. So I end up spending this time. And then and then also, like with the numbers, the actual numbers on the active development side, like when you look at the numbers, 
uh, say there's like eight active developers right now, um, the, the numbers after all is said and done, about five hours to recruit one active developer. So that's that's quite a bit of time when you when you take a look at it. So I'm glad I'm taking the, uh, keeping data on it and so forth. And here's our overall progress. But I want to see this definitely go up. I mean, we're at like when you talk about 150 hours per week, that's about four full time equivalent. So definitely you see a lot of room for that. The teams could be bigger, and we can actually uh, start breaking up into different teams. So. Um, we want to start the tractor team. The the tractor team would would begin with. So I, I'm seeing that. Um, let's see who who we got on a. We do have Alejandro. We've got. Um, yeah, welcome. Um, as far as new people, I think we can actually start the tractor team pretty soon. So that would be um, that would be really good to get that going. Uh, so what I need to do is is prepare a document where we have basically the starting of a working document presenting all the work from before. I mean, there's a lot of work we've done on a tractor. If you go to uh, Tractor uh, Genealogy page on the wiki, I mean, you can go through copious amounts of all the prototypes. So so Lifetrack Genealogy starts with Lifetrack 1 with articulated steering, four-wheel drive, etc. up to the more bulldozer-like devices with tracks. Uh, up to number eight track tractor of 2016 so you can um, you can see more of that uh, if you if you like on the wiki uh, but yeah that's that's good so we present the prior work start with the requirements a concept one of the things we're gonna do is also solar solar drive which means a tiny electric power cube um, the the good thing about hydraulics is that even a one solar panel you know take one solar panel one single solar panel you can drive a heavy tractor with it, it will go very very slowly you you have what you have is a very tiny power unit power cube but it can go very slowly so for certain devices that's really good like for example if you want to do weeding the real application that we want to do here is actually to be pulling chicken tractors. So that means cages with chickens so you can span a whole field while keeping the animal safe. Because everything likes to eat chickens. So you keep them in a cage that just moves. And therefore, instead of a cage, they have the effective area of, say, like an acre or a few acres. Because the you're pulling this cage with a solar GPS tractor that's moving very very slowly like maybe uh, you know like a meter a minute or something like that um, something like that so that's just notes on the tractor team um, I'm gonna go back just a little bit to the the critical path here so um, on a CB press it's actually time so 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 the workshop is coming up uh, pretty quickly I mean it's uh, next month the 25th so about a month wow I mean that's like a month and seven days from now which means in practice we gotta get get the updated design and also the CNC torch cutting so so as soon as I got that pr print cluster up I mean I, I'm gonna be working on it today we're gonna work on it with Christian uh, as far as installing the the Raspberry Pi and things like that But I'm gonna start printing parts for the the torch table and work on that because I mean we're talking about so torched part torch table part printing is right here it's supposed to be happening like right now the green line here is where we are currently July 11 so um, torch table part printing and then uh, the build I mean we're that's starting the build and then part cutting we have to start that within a couple of weeks so schedule is pretty tight um, but it's moving along so things are good um, so last thing is um, let's maybe go to the follow up on the work with people who are here are there things that I missed right now that we need to update because the thing uh, thing we definitely want to get going is uh, if I have the print cluster going we can actually start 
prototyping the parts for the filament extruder and that would be the filament maker so we can make our own filament uh, so that's that's one of the big things to to discuss I think a lot of the team is working on that um, let's see did I miss anything as far as the status of kind of updating we've got a lot of parts c being put into place um, I haven't looked into that in detail I think Roberto knows quite a bit he's been doing the final final assembly here but the next steps would be to yeah I mean get the final assembly and, and move forward to to ordering the bill of materials parts and starting the actual cutting as soon as we we know uh, from the final design that everything is making sense so uh, let's see Roberto do you wanna pipe in or Abe anything on on where we are with that or did I cover just about where we are Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I, I, um, I did the assembly for the, for the two first models. Yeah. And I used uh, only sim simplified parts. Yeah. I, I, I saw that um, some people it's doing very complex parts with many details. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about that because I I understood that we have to do only simplified parts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so for example, like uh, I've seen a lot of different simplified parts, but definitely you want to do it simplified versions because if we're gonna put together the entire um, the entire machine in FreeCAD with all the parts in there of course the files would just be too heavy right so yes do the simplified versions for the STL files of course they remain complex and they remain and then then we print them so that's what we would do they can remain the original complex STL files but when you do the the CAD model, you don't use those full files. You you like to use simplification so you can manage the whole CAD very easily and in a fast way. So, if anyone's like dr drawing parts that are too complex, you don't need to. Like like I'm looking at, for example, I mean, look at this. I mean, that's pretty much what we need. Power supply just representing all the different. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a very simple um, simple concept. So you're representing all the parts, so you can pretty much say label them, and say, okay, this is these are the critical parts that we have labeled, one through n, and that way we can, like from the CAD, it's very clear, like that we have the entire machine that we're not like buying extra parts or whatever. Um, the bill of materials comes clearly out of the CAD. So, um, let's see, what would you say, Roberto, where are we in terms of the final, like how much work do you estimate still needs to happen to complete the extruder parts? Um, if, if I have the, the simplified parts, uh, for, to me it's, it's uh, very easy to assemble those parts. So, mm -hmm. uh, and the other issue is that many parts um, haven't the, the sketches and hidden primitives, so they're uh -huh. not editable. Right, right. So, on that point, what we should mention is that whenever somebody's drawn up the parts, you have to upload all the files. So make sure that when you generate a part, save a file version with the with the underlying sketches so you can edit that. And then if you're doing the final CAD, like the, the overall CAD, to minimize the, the size, 
you can simply eliminate all the other details and in um, and so just upload a simple even simplified version so you have a simplified version with sketches and then you would have a simplified version where you just eliminate all the sketches and then save that just upload that to the wiki as a new version of the file so that in the file versioning you can see okay one file is the original it's got more detail or or more of the underlying sketches but the ones you're actually putting into the, the assemblies don't have that they don't need it you know uh, because when you're working with editing the the assembly or the parts you're always going into the individual parts and then merging the edited part into the more complex assembly you're not editing within the complex assembly you just take the individual part edit that in a separate document so that's the that's the workflow that everyone needs to understand but you do need to have a version history of everything like for example file thermal components um, there's one file here well I can say that right now you probably want to have more files uh, but you're saying it's without sketches so who's done the one with the sketches where is that do we have that for example I, I, I have I have that file yeah so uh, with sketches, but, but I, I, I uploaded the full assembly uh -huh. the four modules and I, I didn't want to re replicate many files so because in, in the full in the full assembly mm -hmm. it's the there are two versions, one with sketches and one without. Yeah, uh, for the full assembly we should probably have just the without just to save memory so it really loads fast and is easy to work with. So we should have the multiple versions at the component level, at the part level. Okay. Yeah, that's that's an important point because the workflow is do all the editing on the individual files and then you're just merging in other words loading that file into the final document so you you update it and then you load it into the complex assembly that's the preferred workflow so that um, it's it's just simply more manageable because then the final assembly is just as simple as possible and it's easier to work work with it I mean definitely it's harder to to work within a document where there's so many different parts and you're trying to edit one it's like you know just navigating through that whole thing it's a, if it's a very complex thing it would be difficult so you just eliminate everything you you have just just the single part file work on that it's easy and fast and you can't mess up you can't mess up it's or if you mess up you're just messing up one part so it's just a preferred workflow uh, so it looks like from uh, this page here that we have so this is a lot about the extruder different extruder parts but uh, looks like we're missing now the the filament winding aspects so um, Roberto would you say that the that the extruder part is pretty much got all the parts in it or is there a bunch of parts still missing like there's a whole load of them missing Uh huh. Okay. Uh, I, I, you uh, was working on the on one of the other modules. Maybe he could say something else. Okay. Uh, Io, do you want to update us on the Hello, wine? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. And um, I've, up, up, it, I've uploaded um, virtually all the STL files I could work on. Um, but there, there are some files here that don't have STL files attached to them. And there, there are quite a number of them. So um, I think I'll need help with knowing how to access the STL files for those ones. Um, so I can create free card files for them. Uh huh. So, are you saying that some of the SDL files are not loading? Um, so, if you if you look at the 
um, park library under school mechanism, there are STL files missing for almost half of them. I see. Um, okay, let's take a look at that. Can you paste the link for everybody? Also, um, for for the school mechanism again, I really had no clue how to label um, the image that we have um, for it because that, there are so many parts and I just can't see how to represent all those parts from that single image. Uh huh. Um, so I, I thought to ask maybe Roberto or somebody with more experience with this if we have. Um, Maybe we need an exploded part diagram or something like that so that we can like draw arrows to all the components or something. Yeah. So let's see how much inside we have. So in the Yeah. So the main working document here, uh, so yeah, we've got I mean this looks pretty good. I mean this is uh Let's see, let's go down to the spooler parts. Yeah. Um, let's see. Filament winder. For example, when you look at, so if you look at my screen on the filament winder, I mean, can you make sense from that a lot or that or are you saying a lot of detail is missing beyond what you would have what what you would need like when you look at this it's this just doesn't do it yeah so lo looking at that that image on slide number 10 which um, represents the school mechanism uh-huh um, it looks to me, or the way I understand it, it looks to me like lots of the components that we can see in the part library, they are, they are hidden, they are like coupled in. You can't see them from that image. So I, I really, I really can't understand how to like label that drawing to that image to show where the different components go. One or two of them are clear that I can see from the image. And I can tell what they are, uh -huh. but the others, I'm assuming, they're like buried behind, away from the point of view of that shot. What happens when you compare that to slide number fifteen? Slide number thirteen. Fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah. I mean, can we identify all those? I mean, there's, there's a lot of different parts. Um, but can we yes, identify? Yes, I guess I could. Yes, that, that's, this is what I was thinking when I was mentioning an exploded part diagram. Yeah, so this is probably what's needed for that school mechanism part. I probably could identify more of the components from this. I think it's important to remember that some of these photos and the documents, they're from Mr. Lyman's PDFs, uh, and some of the components in there are actually deprecated. Uh, the photos still show things that he quit using. Mm. And also some of the, most everything is in the PDFs, I think one way or another, especially in those diagrams. So you go back to the PDF and the diagrams, if you can't see the detail, those diagrams are pretty good. Yeah. So and maybe we should have just used the diagrams more instead of the photos, but uh, the photos show a little bit more um, realism too. So. Uh huh. Photos. 
so you so which which do you want to use then photos or diagrams that you think are more more relevant Abe yeah I, I think in, in hindsight to some degree it almost would be better if we'd broken some of this stuff down in a more modular pattern earlier kind of like we started doing yeah. in the last the modules um, well I'm still not sure all the parts of the modules line up it's trying to organize some of the stuff in the sheets and stuff to modules because it seems like we would want the modules to match how the system might be assembled in real life or in a, in a, in a workshop situation so uh, I don't know if we've got all that exactly in that manner but it, it looks pretty good so the work that's been done on the modules I see a lot more detail and uh, I, I see a bunch such a assembly work on the assembly of the modules done too I was surprised by that I did notice I was I was working on a switch and I guess there's some overlap between the um, the spooler and the extruder we have different people working on those, and I just noticed I was working on a switch, and I see somebody already finished a switch for the spooler, so uh, probably ended up with some redundant work there, but I might need to double-check some of that. Mm -hmm. Maybe you, you have to consider the different measurements for each part, because maybe the, those switches are different. I think that, that they are different. That, that may be. Um, yeah, and I guess we want to use the same things. I think, and it wouldn't really matter other than that the plastic part design might be a little different. I mean, usually the switches should be the same specs. I mean, hopefully we could just buy generic half-inch switches and they should fit, which is what it looks like, what I was working on. But because the switch design doesn't matter that much as long as it fits in the plastic and ideally we don't have to redesign the... Uh, plastic printout although we have all the free cat files that shouldn't be hard to adjust either if we have to change the print for the switch to fit a little bit or sometimes you have to do that anyway as i understand it, with printouts um it's kind of hard for the plastic pieces to fit together just right sometimes there's a little variance mm -hmm. There's, I think, two similar switches in the extruder and probably different toggle switches in the uh, spooler that I saw. Uh, recall I used metal ones, I think, on that one. I think that the, the switches he used were mostly just whatever was easiest. Yeah. For supply reasons. Um, we... I mean, obviously, we're trying to duplicate, I guess, it as close as possible just to uh, make it easy. But from the supply standpoint, if you can use all of the same parts, that would be ideal, too. But yeah. that might have to be changed later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Abe, since you did the diagram or you labeled some of the parts in the slide 15 of the Lyman filament extruder dock... Um, is that, are there any deprecated parts in that, or all those parts, I mean, that's, that's exactly what we're going to build. Yeah, I, I think that the diagrams are more up to date from what I can tell. There's not really anything displayed. I mean, he may have changed some external things that aren't shown there, like I think in some cases he ended up using some of the rubber tubing is displayed in those. He, he ended up using things just like duct tape yeah. on some things to because that was just simpler. So, and obviously that's not going to be displayed in the in the diagram, mm -hmm. but it, it's not a significant thing either. So, um, yeah, I think everything part wise is is shown pretty clearly there. Okay. Um, 
so for example let's see so that's what are these blocks here the gray blocks that's some of the electronics like that's power supply yes, and that other looks switches like, um, see the larger ones the larger one would be the I guess it's just been the power supply I'd have to look back at the PDF and then Six would be control modules. It's like those are supposed to be the ones with the green underneath look like the circuit boards, probably. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, so electronics just explain those other parts in that diagram. Yeah, yeah. So, IO, for example, I mean, how many of the parts within this diagram? do we already have um i think you can identify all the printed parts right i mean you i think they're pretty pretty detailed here so you do you think you can figure all that out uh, as far as all the 3d printed parts yeah so some of the parts look familiar from here so um i can try mm -hmm. But would you, um, so how, how would I approach it now? Should I try to reconcile with the, with the numbering here or I should, um, okay, I should use the numbering on the, um, on, on the part library, I guess. Yeah. So I guess I, I'll, I'll lift that drawing and try to try to apply the numbering on the, on the part library. I guess that's what needs to be done. Yeah, let's see. So if we go to the part library, um, so parts gallery, spooler mechanism here. Yeah, okay. So we recognize some of those pieces. Um, so yeah. this is the stuff that's missing. Yeah, those would be, those look like maybe they are not the 3D printed parts. So with all those 3D printed parts, let's assume those are all 3D printed and the rest are not. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it looks like this, yeah, like all these screws and everything. Um, I mean, see if you can, let's see, how do we coordinate that one diagram with the part library? Um, what's the best way to go? Because we initially talked about, okay, let's take let's each person make um like like uh, to give you an example like this like what um what roberto did here uh basically just label just take just about everything and label it um and make it very detailed but but at the same time like Roberto, maybe you can feed back on this. So this is a diagram that's pretty detailed, but but I mean, there's so many little other pieces that are missing. Like for example, okay, like what about this bolt, this wire, any other things? Like where are we finally reconciling that we actually have all the parts? Because maybe like this goes from 13 parts, maybe up to like 50, you know, like. Because the idea was that we break... So here in this diagram, in slide number two of Lyman Film and Extruder, we broke down the thing into parts. And then we said, okay, every person, please label a part pretty much completely. So that... Eat, so we have seven, altogether seven diagrams with a lot of arrows to them. Um... Do you guys think that would be doable and maybe even like go to here? I mean, I like this, like this. This we can understand. Okay, there's seven seven main parts. And then each one of them maybe take one or two pages. So you do have absolutely every single number attached to a part. And then that would almost... Um, that would almost supersede the part library. Like what we, what we should probably do is use these links in our diagrams to make everything clear, like that we're not missing parts. Like for example here, that we label absolutely everything. 
there's a little bolt here I see like little bolts there I see bolts there I see you know all these different components so we can visually observe it and say okay this actually has everything and then we can go to the part library page and we can say okay that's where we're just storing the files or representing the individual files in also a very clear way like say you wanna um, it would almost be redundant like the part library is almost the same as this visual index except the part library is more you know it's just a list it doesn't really get you to understand how the parts fit together but they will also like if you want to see like in this so in this diagram in this uh, visual diagram you don't necessarily all see all the parts clearly so the 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 part library would serve to make those parts very explicit uh, but the most important thing in my view right now is to make sure that we are not missing parts and the design is complete and integrated that you know we start building this we're printing out 3d printed parts um, we can do that definitely and we can see okay it all works so that's level number one and then level number two is put in all the other mechanical components fasteners motors wires and everything else but what would really be make it effective is when this diagram has just about everything so that you don't you know like say I'm building this or somebody's prototyping it actually right then we don't see oops we, we don't get into the conditions where whoops we missed parts and then you have delays like you know every time you gotta get a part it's like uh, you know a few days or maybe even a week delay and you go through those several of those cycles and you end up spending a lot of time to get all the parts so that's why this visual diagram should have everything so can I propose that um, if there is like so I, I would expect seven of these diagrams so so we got say one say one here um, you know let's see one here so let's call it let's get really specific here so this is one uh, so we're going up to seven uh, let's make it um, bold and larger so was this this was Abe Abe this is yours right so Abe for example can I ask you that in this one okay I see seven seven items nine items let's get more 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 details bolts little bolts wires so maybe like set another set up another page for bolts and wires or or add more to this um, does that sound Abe does that sound like a good idea so that we have this and then maybe one ABC this is like all the main parts maybe the second one would be um, you know second one would be hardware and the third one would be wires or something like that because uh, each one of them is it's pretty extensive Hey, but what, what do you think of that? I mean, does that make sense? Or, because because the question is, how do we make sure we have everything in in our diagrams, and so we, when we actually go build it, we can we can from this diagram generate a complete bill of materials that's actually accurate. It's not like oh, this part may or may not be there. It's 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 for real. Abe, can you comment? Abe, did you disappear? Uh, we can't hear you. Audio issue. Okay. Uh, can you type in, does, do you, do, is what I said make sense or is that uh, not make sense? I have a question. Go ahead. Um, you, you're saying that the, the original uh, instructions are not uh, enough for, for building 
Y yeah, uh, that's that's correct in a sense that some details may be missing in other places. Maybe he tells you like a couple of different ways without specifying a part, or there may be deprecated parts. That's what I learned from parts that are no longer used. That's what I learned from Abe. I haven't examined the document in so much detail myself, but reading through it, I can see it's not its not an exact document. It might be a little general, like it will not give you an actual part. So that's why we would have to... We have to replicate... Yeah, um, FreeCAD is useful, yes, because then we can generate everything else from FreeCAD. Yeah, yeah. And first, and the first answer to your question is that he has not produced. We asked him for the CAD, but he's not. He hasn't provided it to us, so that's why we're rebuilding everything, and also for our workflow, re simplifying parts, so we actually can manage and work with this very effectively within CAD. So we can go through all the other different assets that we need from from like for example language agnostic instructionals even you know fabrication diagram just just uh technical drawings everything exploded part animations we can do everything from that so but that's the idea like the sure the sure what we're after here is that we generate a model that is actually complete and if you look at his model, like, for example, take a look at his, um, you know, page 15. Like, is his model complete? Um, possibly. He might have all the parts in there, but, but some parts... Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, this kind of design, what he has here, is quite good. But, I mean, it's not in FreeCAD, so we, I mean, we, we don't have access to it. He... We don't have it, so that's why we're we're redoing it. Um, now, Roberto, is what I said about? Can you uh, hear me now? Yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I think the some of the issues with the the PDFs and things like that are they can be a little confusing, but they shouldn't be a huge problem. Um, I think that. All the parts that got listed so far were things that that aren't deprecated, especially in the uh, in the sheet list. So sometimes those are a good reference too. And I know there's a lot of different uh, files to reference to some degree, but that's kind of what we have to work with so far. I think that the um, I think the most accurate list is probably at this point those master part indexes to some degree as far as the parts i tried to get all the parts mm -hmm. into sections with the modules that i thought they belonged in uh there are some parts that are just kind of general the bolts obviously they just go all over the place uh they're listed where it seemed like um it was most appropriate or just in a general area by themselves but uh, I think that the part index sheets are kind of broken down by the modules, although some of that may have uh, changed. I think the way people uh, started displaying stuff by the photos in the visual ends, and maybe I, I saw some uh, assemblies of more parts as well. Uh, yeah. People were starting to work on uh, the broader assemblies instead besides just the individual parts, which was good. I noticed that um, that there are certain assembly stages that seem to match the, the kind of like the photos, which is good because that's kind of the way he assembled it. Those PDFs do, do a good job of showing how he. And those uh, certain assembly files, like for the wiring on the electronics, uh, I was thinking that once that plastic shell, the top, is, is assembled, mm -hmm. that the wiring would be put in, you know, at that point. So some of those things get them assembled in, in certain groups and then we can add some of the detail that way uh, so there's probably certain ways to break it down maybe more 
modules or, or once we have the full cat of course we can just kind of hide the parts we don't want and uh, show steps to assembly that way as well obviously yeah yeah okay I um, think that most of the plastic parts are done so that 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 does help a lot with the overall assembly yeah yeah definitely we're, we're getting closer we're definitely getting closer so what I would suggest here like yes the master index is very useful by all means and I think the way that our workflow can go is we we go to the so we've got this which is the modules breakdown then we have things like this which is the visual diagram for each module and I would also call out for okay let's do uh, more detail for the bolts and wires and any little details so we, we detail this out more and then once we have that then we can go back to the master index like you are saying and then we can say okay excellent now we know that okay there's exactly like you know like for example for the the extruder electronics you've got 12 parts listed um, well I can tell you right there that there are missing parts like screws right and if you don't have that screw on hand you're not gonna be able to build that so so we would then take our visual diagrams and details and then add more parts so basically finish all these master indices completely so we can go from the visual to the master index and then from the master index I'm gonna go down this purchasing link and buy everything and get it get it shipped or go to the store or whatever so so this so for me the end product is this column right here the purchasing link that is a verified list that's been passed through the CAD through the visual diagrams and it all makes sense to us so that's a deal but I will also say you know like wire um, or wire connectors we have to be a little more specific like for example wire connectors female spade well what gauge you know like for example when I click on this link which one am I gonna choose so that should be detailed a little more out do we need like three different ones like there's just spades or are there some ring or whatever um, just just a little more detail so that when we do it it actually you know it's actually working it's we're not we're not like oh we didn't get the right one we gotta go back to the store and then spend a week uh, you know lose a week doing that so yeah but does that make sense to everybody and if so like our yeah uh, first of all does that all make sense yes I was going to draw in I figured we'd actually draw the spade connectors because uh, they're kind of important to the electronics you can't really you need all of that stuff listed and shown in there to some degree even if it's not really high resolution exactly um, exactly the wiring can done I think fairly easy I, I did work with paths before on some of that belt stuff so I think I, I think I know how that works uh, it shouldn't I don't think it was that hard to do those paths and you know just put in some colored wires mm-hmm okay and I, I, mm -hmm. I added the detail to the power supplies and some of those electrical components so that it would be easier to label and maybe show some connections about wiring a little easier uh, I figured that that was important. If we might need to add a little more detail to some of the electronics that should be too hard to do. Maybe uh, fasteners from the fastener workbench, that kind of thing can help with that. Uh huh. Uh, just to show screws on the spades or wire, wiring points. Okay. But I, I know that that probably, a lot of that probably needs to be left out of the uh, larger simplified diagram so um, I don't know how much in fact I don't know how much we, wiring might slow down or use too much memory in the in the larger view of course most of that's inside the box so if you're just looking at the box I think that's all included and if I understand in FreeCAD uh, the display and the rendering speed should be based on what's what's shown on the screen yeah 
Yeah, that's right. But that's the case for like, you know, say you have a hundred parts in a, in a document, but each one of them is 5K. Well, that entire document is 500K. That's n not a problem at all. That's what I'm saying. As long as we've got the, the simple individual items, we should not run into any issues at all with respect to being able to render that and, and work with it effectively in the CAD. So, yeah, does that make sense? It looks like, yeah, yeah, it does. Okay, so so let's yeah. let's just discuss this refined process. So, so this is what we talked about before. We're talking about creating the full CAD um, and see Roberto log for final assembly example. Uh, let's see, final assembly example right there. Yeah, like uh, that's that's what we were showing today. So we are doing that, and now we're we're looking at the module. So basically, let's go. Let's kind of start from uh, the beginning as far as what we're actually doing according to what we talked about today. Because I I think we're getting it, but it's just just complex because. Um, it's it's a complex you know it's quite a quite a complex machine so let's say okay so we've got breakdown into modules just so let's just document this whole process so everyone is clear so breakdown into modules which is page two uh, I'm gonna link to that directly here so so breakdown into modules okay for each module detail the parts list the parts with arrows so a good example of that is for example um, well, let's let's take this one. That was the first one. So let's let's just take a look at that. So that's a great example. So we're pretty well on that, but overall, I think we're missing a few. Like, I know we've got the big. So that's two. This is three. We're looking for seven. This is like four. Um, okay, this definitely needs a lot of work, right? Spooler electronics, like we need some labels on that. Um, six is the tension mechanism. And then seven is the spool mechanism. Great, okay, so we've got placeholders at least for those. So now all these remaining ones need a lot of work, right? So label it exhaust label them exhaustively um, so then continue working on each module add a fasteners slide fasteners plus small parts slide and then add a wiring, add a wiring and electronics detail. Yeah, so basically the the list parts with arrows, that was basically for the bulk structure. Which is obvious. But but okay, that's looking great. But for example, like with number six, we need to detail absolutely everything. That bolt there that wire there etc you know what that's etc et so we go through that so I think that's like the two you know these two things so probably end up with two or three slides for each uh, module so I'm gonna say here end up with two to three slides for each module so that's that's a total of if there are seven so that's like 
14 to 21 slides total. And if it's easy, just use one slide. I mean, and let's let's call it about two slides. I mean, some of them are going to be much easier than others. And then uh, add links to very specific part ordering sources. Yeah. So I mean, uh, I mean, before we're there, we're doing the CAD. I mean, do the simplified CAD. Think about think placeholders, basically, so we don't do not miss anything. So simply enough that just represented it's a placeholder. Okay, then we add links to the specific part ordering sources. Then we go back to the master index and we we continue filling in that master index to make sure all the parts are in there. Okay? So that's the next big point. So then go back to master index and fill in any missing parts. Great. And then what else is left? Um, then, it's, then we also had the part library. Okay, so for the part library, since the part library already exists there, uh, just verify that all the parts are in the part library, and and if there's parts that don't belong, erase them. Verify all the parts are there. And you can use the part library where you actually link to the CAD file. So both the document, both the visual diagram, and part library have the same links. And that's how you know your part library is correct because you've seen it like like I look at the visual diagrams as like the ultimate sense making documents they help you make it uh, make sure that you don't miss anything so let's say the visual diagrams are used as the sense making documents And then the, the final CAD assemblies are our source. I mean, that's the actual, yeah, I mean, that's, from there we can source for, for doing any further work on this project. So say we went through the first prototype, we need to change things, we go back to the CAD, and um, once again, we go to the individual part files, we work on those, and we merge those into the final assembly dot, uh, CAD files. So, so that's, that's kind of the, the basic workflow here. So this is our July 11 refine process. So with that said, um, let's see. Let's go back to the, the work allocation document here. And with that said, I mean, are you guys um, good to go on that? And what would your next steps be?
Abe, so you're you're clear on the next steps? So probably do your in, in addition to your your doc to this. Give us more detail. And then verify the, the final final master index. Uh, put it into the master index. Does that make sense? Roberto, for you, take this, maybe add one or two more with all the very fine fine elements, and then go into add those parts to the master index. Uh, for this, this was Dixon. I think this and the yeah yeah just making sure we don't miss any any things like for example the bolts that attach this like I, I assuming those are bolt holes how, are, how what exactly is attached so so make sure you've got everything here like uh, whatever else there is um, let's see yeah go ahead Yeah. How do we do that? Uh, you want to start up an instance of Slack? Okay. If that could help, let's do that. So maybe if you can take on the, do that and uh, post it. If you can post it also on the 3DP uh, network group. Yeah, are people using the network group? I haven't been using thought, it. Yeah, I thought the network group um, would be more effective for that sort of thing because a lot of information gets buried in Slack. Yeah. Especially if you have tags going on for a long time, it's almost possible to search and find information that people look at. But the network, you can organize around different threads and then you can go back to whatever specific. Um, where you need to pick up information from. That's, that's, that would be my preference. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, it's like email people. I would suggest, yeah, I mean, that's why that's why we're not using Slack because, I mean, we had all these projects and it's like at some point you just lose it, you know, just lose, lose coherence. I mean, you're welcome to try with people who, who are going to do it, but it really... Is a matter of what's gonna stick to where, that people actually stick with. I would say continue on the dev group and just email people more. You know, like email to coordinate more. Um, maybe if you can do. It. I mean, you're still welcome to <laughs> to to start the Slack. But I mean, uh, if if everyone responds to you, that would be great. But we kind of have to. Tr I would say you know possibly do it as an experiment and see if people actually do end up using it. But but we do have the the network which is supposed to be used for that purpose um, and then emails we can email people uh, on a on a developer thread like like I we have that email thread on the for the developers um, but yeah yeah I, I do agree I mean there's issues email I mean just email yeah. Email more. Like like official projects have like a dev dev list, so it'll be like a email list since there's not 
too many people yet, I think we can still continue doing that on email. So I, I would really suggest between email and and a dev group to post post things. Um, and Joseph, um, see Joseph, you still on? No. Um, but maybe I can remind Joseph to. No, I mean we, everyone has access to that email group. We can follow up with that, and I, I can send an email to make sure everybody has the contact. There's a couple of new people, but um, yeah, we. I think that email thread would be most effective. But let's do that. Um, okay, let's see. But let's let's continue. So, Roberto, do you have um, enough clarity to go on for now, or? You mean for the overlap, for example, when there's an overlap of parts in different modules? And when... Sorry, I... You mean for the case, because the, the modular breakdown is supposed to resolve those kinds of conflicts, you're generating the parts that are in those modules, but you're saying that sometimes one module might have the same part as another. Is that what you're saying? Right. I mean, for that, what's supposed... Right. So so we have a list. So the way it works, we do have the list of people like the extruder. We've got the slide number eight as far as the work, what the allocation was. So the thing there should be click on their log. If it doesn't exist on their log, that means you should take, take it. Um, if they're not putting things immediately on their log, they're not following procedure. But the procedure is that as soon as you've got anything, you put it on your log so you can verify from others' logs whether that part is taken already or not. That should be the way it works. I mean, that's the only way it can work. That's why we emphasize you got to publish on your log as soon as you've got anything. Yeah. yeah. So that that should resolve it. I mean, basically, uh, click on click on their logs. Uh, explain that. I am I'm, I'm not sure about who is really working on, on, on that module of the only we, we I can see the, their names but working on, on that because when I when you Yeah, but that mean the assumption is if nobody else answers, like, assume it's not done. So, one is assume it's not done, and then you go to their log. If it's not there, it doesn't exist. I mean, really, the super rule here is if it's not on a wiki, it does not exist, and, you, and you're welcome to take it. I mean, that's, that's the culture we all have to learn. Otherwise, we'll never be able to coordinate more than a few people. So... Right now we've got the development log page, and in it we've got the you know every week's uh, agenda, which typically has the work breakdown and also has the list of all our developers. So the the only thing you can say is okay, I click on his his uh, log person's log, and like I mean that's what I do. Like if I click on somebody's log, and it's not updated, my assumption is okay, it's not done. Period. You know. 
that's that's all it means i mean and, and that's what we need that's why we need absolutely need to uh, log all our work as soon as we have something even before we have something like like put a placeholder that you're actually working on something you know uh, so so that's the that's like the important cultural point we all need to learn maybe we should emphasize it but i try to emphasize it all the time like if it's not on a wiki it does not exist period i mean if if our whole team could understand that then we really you know could collaborate to no limit like if there's a thousand people and they're working together you know say say in like 12 person teams but you know they click on everybody's work and um if it's remote work and they're not talking to each other in, in person the the substitute for that is your log i mean that's that's why that log is so critical yeah but yeah um yeah 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 absolutely so so maybe that's something i'm learning that we really need to absolutely uh clarify to everybody and we'll get better at this but i mean the vision is that you can have an unlimited number of people and the project still doesn't collapse so you know i've been on this project for a decade now um and i've seen a lot of how this stuff works like how you can have people starting to edit the wiki it goes and goes and all of a sudden just collapses just total collapse and the page becomes a mess you know um, that's basically the state of our entire wiki at this point because we don't really have good management I mean, you need to have people who understand the process and then actually people who manage but part of that big part of that is the culture which says that publish early and often and, and if it's not in a wiki it doesn't exist that kind of thing and of course there's a lot to be done as far as formal processes like if we develop a process and we say okay this is exactly the protocol that we use with everybody only by such standards can you get large numbers of people to work on it otherwise people will be doing things differently and it'll be hard for things to be coordinated but that's that's kind of like the lesson on on how to collaborate here um so right now and and it's like you know the thing that that may get in the way too is like if a person doesn't do their work right like you're you're like well what's going on is where is that work you're you're guessing is it is it done or is it is it not done and and the default answer just simply has to be no it's not done because it's not on a log um so we have to we have to do that um as a team okay uh but let's see so who else so so basically um, you know for your time allotment for the week just pick you know look at what has been done if you're finished with yours there's the basic process we have right now as far as page number three this is this is what we're agreeing we're we're going with and uh, if you're done with your part and you still have more time just you know go go further and then just to go with let's see so that's Roberto that's good I think Io I think you you're pretty decent on what you you can do um, Cassie and Israel I'm not sure because they're not here uh, will I think will continue I think you've been uh, I've seen parts coming from you so that's good and Abe that's good good but but yeah um, as soon as we get to the complete visual diagrams and then we refine the master index to verify between the master index and the visual diagram we're ready to print and we're ready to buy parts so it seems like we may be like you know a couple of weeks away from that but it's i mean it's definitely moving forward like you know like slide number seven right here you know that's that's a lot and I think uh, just get those little missing details like like for example those bolt holes like after we do this then we do want another file that's got even more detail so that in FreeCAD for example when we when we end up doing the final um, for example exploded part diagrams you ever see how like in some product they have this really really complex diagram with like a hundred arrows well we should be able to do that with our complete models that's the end goal because that will be like say say this is a final product and it's a real 
finished release and it's the official version then people can go for example to the full exploit part diagram and see how every single thing works if they want to buy like a little part or make it that exploit part diagram can refer them to to all the different parts so for us like the eventual exploit part diagrams would definitely be hyperlinked where we have links to files or to sources and so forth so those all all those assets will be generated down the road and maybe not exactly right now but but we do need the absolute full complete CAD to make that possible so that's kind of the the long of it okay so I think that's uh, we've got um, a lot to work on on a filament extruder let's see just to f finish up with anyone else who's on a on a meeting today um, any other updates that we need to bring up to the whole meeting um, I had some ideas of um, uh, maybe how to make the the wiki page part library a bit more uh, understandable. Uh -huh. uh, would it be okay if this week I, I um, like a, uh, a replica page or just add it in the page to, to test out some, some different ideas on um, the wiki a bit more uh, full and um, just simple things like in the free cut, maybe we can like color codings, for instance, let's make all off shell parts yellow before exporting them all 3D printing, for example. Yeah, yeah. And in a later stage, when we make the assembly, stand the, co the color codes, it will be really easy to read the, uh, read the assembled files. Yeah. Make clear instruction. In a later stage, um, yeah. Another idea I had, but I don't know if that's possible. For for example, um, also in three D printed par parts, maybe we can make engravings and tag with text. Like it's not that difficult to do. It yeah, yeah. Pre no, that's or that's containing a link to where mm -hmm. the file is found. Mm -hmm. so also, once the that you can always trace them back. Yeah, yeah. Those. But I don't know. Those are improvements. Um, yeah, I think what would be worthwhile is, yeah, if you have some ideas of organizing uh, that page. Now, uh, would you be able to continue working on some of the part generation like you've been doing? or? Yeah, I can also, like, there's still a lot of parts in the spool mechanism and also in the... Uh, um, big box enclosure. I can just keep uh, parts to free cut as well. Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, let's uh, focus on that. Let's prioritize that. But definitely, I mean, you're also welcome to edit any page on the wiki as well. I mean, the wiki does have a version history, so that we can revert to older versions if we want to. So, things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds good. Library. Uh... There's a lot of pieces that maybe uh, would, would not be useful for the final building. Yeah, I mean, we should feel free to just trash them. I mean, just get rid of them. I don't know which those are, but if you see the ones that just definitely aren't used, yeah, yeah. Do it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oliver, do you have any updates on... Any of your work, or can you hear me? Well, yep, yep, got it. Uh, go ahead. Me? Yes, go ahead. Uh, okay. Um, I um uh, went on with um producing a sensor head for the uh, torch height controller made it from copper a copper ring which i hammered flat yeah in my lock uh, photo of it 
um, the most stuff I've done, I have uh, made a little video of it on YouTube, but I made some screenshots so that we here have things to talk about. Um, basically, I did that and huh. uh, connected this with a, a shielded coaxial cable. Yes. Yeah. Oh wow. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Shielded it with a um, coaxial cable and so made a sensor probe, which uh, is uh, better than the oscilloscope probe I had for the first tests. Mounted it on my test rig and then started uh, doing some experiments at first where I moved the text rig test rig by a stepper motor in steps of 100 microns or uh, 0.1 millimeters uh, in, a, in a time of one millis uh, 100 milliseconds each over a distance of 10 millimeters. Oh, wow. So, and, uh, and then I wrote a program in processing. Processing is the, the uh, visualization language with, which is um, um, yeah, famous for being the basic where the uh, Arduino IDE is made from. It's, yeah. it's the same stuff, and uh, but it's good for visualizing things. And I wrote a program which um, can get the data from the PCB uh, over USB port and uh, make some some curve diagrams. Yeah, and you can see they are very straight going up and down uh, according to what happens on the, or what movements are happening on the test rig. Wow. And in this setup, it is that the test rig is moved by an external controller, which is the old manual THC controller. I, I wrote a little firmware which moves it continually forward and backward. And the new PCB is only doing so far the measuring. And um, I think the results uh, look good, relatively good. There are still some quirks or irregularities where I'm wondering about. I mean, the last day I was exploring this stuff and getting, trying to get a feeling of what's going on. There are small things which irritates me. For example, I was uh, watching out if there is maybe a little drift or something, but uh, not really. I made a test where I uh, left it in one position overnight, and on the next day it was nearly uh, showing the same values. So huh. no drift uh, there. But on the other hand, the whole system is quite sensitive against any uh, influences of electromagnetic fields. For example, if you get near with your hand, you, you as a human are full of electric signals and uh, that has much influences and so on. However, um, uh, one discovery I made, which was really mm. yeah, a, a great thing for me was um, that I could uh, get better signal when I'm doing some grounding, but grounding means in this case not uh, connect everything to the normal ground, but ah, yeah, there's, a, there's a photo, but um, instead to the shielding. I mean, the AD7747 processor has a pin which is labeled shield, uh -huh. and this is connected with the surrounding. Uh, 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 shield uh, on the coaxial cable mm -hmm. and uh, for example my, my test rig uh, was not electrically connected with, with all this in any way but um, it was a great uh, improvement when I tried out with a, with a crocodile clip to make a connection between the shielding uh, uh, um, uh, fabric uh, the shielding wires and, and the structure of, of, the, of, the, of the test brick uh, that made the signal uh, quite, quite better. But um, I also have found that um, uh, 
for example, if I then change the position of where I connect my, my shielding crocodile clamp, that can make a huge difference in where the starting level of the, of the, of the, of the measurement range, where, where it starts. And one time I had the effect that it made a difference uh, in one situation, I could go over a distance of three centimeters very well. And then I made some changes and then suddenly I had a distant, uh, distance of five centimeters. This is what I mean as a kind of irregularities which I'm still exploring. And I think um, uh, what, what is maybe still needed is a kind of calibration. There are in the data sheet written some things how to calibrate it and doing stuff with some internal registers and so on. Uh, yeah, but that sounds quite complicated. But um, maybe I can do a kind of relative calibration. I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking about that. Um, and another point which I would call an irregularity is um, there is a formula which describes um, how to uh, calculate um, the, the capacitance value which we would expect by um, um, independence of um, some nature constants like the permittivity but also on the um, uh, surface area of the sensor probe and the distance between these things. And I've calculated that for, um, yeah, for my sensor probe. And um, I came to an expected value that the capacitance should be in the range of 0 0.5 picofarad. I mean, the, the measuring range of the chip is about 8 picofarad, so 0 0.5 would quite nice and that would, was was the value which I have calculated. This is my theoretical expectation value. This is what I expect to measure. What I measured instead is more in the range of yeah, I've 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 labeled my, my diagrams with milli femtofarad, which is another word for atofarad. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's about four magnitude orders uh, uh, smaller. So um, on the other hand, the signal is quite handy. I, I mean, I, I can I can work with it. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but this is a thing which still irritates me. Why I get a very smaller signal than I have calculated. Yeah. Huh. You but calculated these are still things to you... explore and um, basically. As you can see in the diagrams, there seem to be a reasonable signal. I have made uh, three kind of experiments. The first is what I said before is the variation along one centimeter with uh, um, um, 0 0.1 millimeter steps, which is uh, accordingly to what we have seen last week in the in the video of this guy, uh, Clement Viktorovich, or what the name was. Mm -hmm. You remember he he did his video with the same setup, so that was the reason why I started with this. And then I made a second um, run where I made a variation along five centimeters distance, which also works well. And in the diagram you see a broader range uh, mm. where it goes over. And then I made a third uh, run experiment run where I moved manually, not with the, with the stepper motor. I have, I've switched off the stepper motors and moved the carriage by hand uh, along my, my, my uh, marks, which I have uh, um, painted on the, on the test rig in, in one centimeter distances. It's always one centimeter more over a total distance of five centimeters. So on each mark, I waited one, two, or 
or three seconds so that in the diagram then there is a little plateau and you can see on the beginning of each plateau a little peak which yeah. is when I put my hand onto the carriage that is the electrical influence of my body but what you can see in this diagram is a kind of of stair stair up and stair down yeah like this where I variated in one centimeter wise steps five centimeters in total forward and then backward and that is um, yeah what we can see from this is um, about the linearity the the, the uh, thing is not completely linear means the lowest step has the biggest height and if you go upwards to a higher higher steps meaning more bigger distance uh, then uh, then the range is getting a little bit or the, the, the staircase height is getting a little bit smaller uh, this is uh, what what we discussed already last week mm. and uh, it's, it's not a real problem especially since uh, we are probably mostly interested in the mirror and all now or maybe not maybe we, we no. Yeah, I, I think we, we don't want to be as tight as possible on the sofa as we want to be as as uh, distant from it because the, the metal plate is hot and it's of course better if you can move 22 two centimeters or 20 millimeters above the surface and uh, but still have a reasonable signal to uh, check our height yeah and um, so far, these are all brand new experiments. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really working literally until the last second for the meeting began. That's the reason why I was a little bit late. However, and um, what I'm doing now is my next step. I said here in this uh, shown experiments, the test trick uh, was moved externally. But the next logical step is to make a marriage between the cap sensing part of the new PCB and of course the periphery, which is the jog wheel and the PB6600 driver. And um, uh, my next step will be to put all these modules into the firmware so that the thing can control itself and its own movements. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting to see if, if uh, for example, the stepper motor is uh, controlled from the same board. Maybe this may have uh, uh, some some noise influences or whatever. I hope not, but we will see that. I have in the morning made a little test run, which seems to suggest that there will be no problem, but we will see. I have at the moment mixed the the old firmware of the of the uh, manual height controller which is only doing the periphery with the firmware from the new pcb which is so far only doing the cap sensing stuff i have to mix it together and that will be then the end resulting firmware and with this then I have everything tested on the board, meaning not only the cap sensing, but also how the cap sensing is working together uh, when when the periphery comes into play. Yeah. 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 That's so far my state from well, here. You said the calculated value is a picofarad? Yes, the calculated va value should be um, 0 0.5 picofarad and the real measured value is um, um, 1 point, uh, 0 0.1 femtofarad yeah? meaning we are about a factor of 10,000 meaning four magnitudes of order lower than expected I mean yeah. maybe I've made uh, a fault in my calculations but um, ah, I'm, not, I'm not sure it's, it's 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 pretty clear. I mean, the other guys who are well working with that have also seen that the signal is in the femtofarad range, and this is uh, what 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 can also be seen on the on the uh, monitor uh, program where I always have in the right corner uh, showing the original value as it came 
from the uh, cap sensing uh, 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 board. So hmm. the um, 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 an error in the in the in the firmware or a small small error maybe um, that can be made better. I think this is not uh, an issue of calibration. It, it seems to be a kind of systematic error in, 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 in the firmware, maybe. Huh. However, the, it's not such a big problem as it normally would be because the signal is sort of clear and uh, I have the feeling I can work with it. But uh, huh. I also want to um, enlighten the background of the things and, of course, as a scientist, you know, you have an expectation value, and if it's four magnitudes of order smaller, yeah, or it's 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 a good thing to compare you you measure that data with an ex, uh, expectation value. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, um, that, so your ring, yeah? uh, yes. the capacitance should be larger yeah. if you have a ring like like the typical rings that I see are maybe like like I don't know maybe like a half inch half inch wide and you've got how wide is your ring like half inch maybe like a two or three two or three probably like say the two two inch at, across yeah the ring is at the moment uh, 42 millimeters outer diameter and 32 millimeters inner diameter that gives us uh, um, um, the, the the ring broadness is five millimeters and from this broadness, I have calculated the surface area, and uh, this this value is related to my sensor. Meaning, if I uh, would take a, a bigger diameter ring, then I would get another value. But um, I have cal I, I've taken into account the surface area of my sensor. This was uh, was load into the formula and therefore uh, the, the irregularity is there meaning um, uh, with a bigger diameter you get probably another value but maybe also for magnitudes of order different from 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 what you measure yeah? right do you have a plan for how you resolve that difference or or no no idea uh, again please do you have a uh, way to I mean how do you know that it's just maybe not a simple calibration issue or something because the, the for magnitudes of order is is too big for my taste that's why I assume it um, I, I would more uh, assume that there's maybe some um, thing in the formula where in the firmware the capacitance is, 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 is calculated yeah. Uh, assumption. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so it mean it could, this could mean if that's the case, that would mean that in fact the the, the AD chip uh, uh, senses bigger value, but somehow we calculate it in the firmware smaller than it is in real time. What uh, what um, uh, argues for that is that the signal is sort of yeah stable or strong yeah. or however you will call it yeah right right i, I mean, mean you, you can see in the pictures yeah. um, I, I mean the curves i have i have made there was a, a nearby a electric stepper motor driving the thing and stuff so therefore we have relatively small noise in, in the signal yeah 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 that's pretty amazing yeah and, and and i said if it's the case and if there is a little calculation error in the firmware that's that's what I what I called a systematical error and but since we are dealing with relative distances yeah um, yeah it may be not necessary to solve this problem that's what I mean meant in, in the beginning when I said maybe we can do some kind of relative calibration yeah, yeah, yeah. meaning sure. like in the beginning you move it tight to the surface and uh, press a button and it checks the value and that's our zero value it's it's a home position if you want and then we go let's say three centimeters upward and that's our 
position or whatever, yeah, like this, and that that uh, it, it samples these values on on the beginning of each run, and then he knows what its is its range, and from this range we we calculate the millimeters and the the, the following or the the, the the movement, the, the the balancing movement of the of the head. Yeah. yeah. My idea. When you say I, I will, I will see this clearer when when I've when I've uh, married uh, the firmware when I've mixed everything in one firmware and have this complete and yeah then I I, I will I will try and yeah. get from there or try to develop some method of kind of relatively calibration or whatever yeah yeah so uh, and I have to say of course. With this, I'm nearly getting on the borders of my knowledge. I mean, I'm a biologist and no physic, physis, physicist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and, um, I do my best, and yeah. But sometimes there, there, are, there are practical experiments can replace uh, theoretical knowledge. <laughs> yeah. I'll try to get some people to review that. Like Shane might be able to put, provide some feedback on this. He's an electronics guy. Okay, the guy who did our circuit. Yeah, what, what you maybe also can do is ask Aiden um, what is really his last uh, firmware version. I think I have his last version, but maybe there's one version he made one or two days later, but have not linked in or something. Or you, 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 could, you could check that simply. Maybe... That could be the solution for the for the uh, 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 um, expected value uh, difference. Could be. I mean, the firmware you're yeah. just using using Aiden's firmware. Firmware. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. I mean, that that could be one source of that. I mean, as long as we've got a a stable value that you can track. I mean, the relative is perfectly yeah. fine. So that's good. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, that's it's, pretty it's, good. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter. As, as long as it is stable, we can work with this. And the only concern is that it is really in that very, very small range. I mean, we are talking of a few atto parts uh, that's really small. If it really should be in this range, then it's, it's clear that it's quite more sensitive against outer influences of noise than if it would be in a higher range range but if it really operates in the range it should and mm. we are yes. by some calculation error pr producing wrong 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 data yeah, then uh, yeah, yeah. yes that's right and when you did your experiment did you have the grounding to the the shielding pin like the can, can you repeat that question when you did your experiment, did you have the proper grounding, or this was done without the proper ground? Uh, no, this was with the uh, uh, proper grounding where I have connected the thing also. But as I said, the grounding or doing changes with the grounding uh, has much influence of the basic level where where the thing where the thing starts. For example, I've made these experiments and uh, in the diagrams you can see a range from let's say zero let's say 120 140 millifemtofarads and then I exchanged the PCB and took one of the other PCBs and then I suddenly was in the range between zero and 300 uh, uh, millifemtofarads but the, the, when I made the movement, then it was within these 300 um, a range of 100 where it was variating. So uh, it's a kind of continuity. Like I said, I'm still playing around with that and exploring it and trying to get uh, a feeling for what, 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 what is happening here. Yeah, but another uh, uh, a board instead of the other one, or if you clamp the the uh, a shield crocodile clamp different position, or if you make it loose and clamp it on the same position, that can make a shift in the in the ground level, and it feels a bit like if if by these actions the the AD chip is maybe uh, puzzled or, or or influenced or something like this. 
that's 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 my uh, impression is on the new level and I, I switch the board off and switch it on again then it's it's again on this level then it, it somehow has learned that level or, or, or something yeah mm. but yeah I'm still uh, discovering it and I, I think in the end situation you will have a stable setup I mean my, my test rig is also quite wobbly or a little bit wobbly because I have just sit it on my table and uh, it can move if I if I push it a little bit or from the vibrations of the stepper motor for example um, in the first experiment where I made the uh, one centimeter step forward backward forward backward um, I have made a run where I, I've made, I have sampled it over a longer period and I, I was seeing that the um, um, thing was slightly going upwards, like a drift, like it was drifting. But then later I, 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 I found that uh, uh, when, when, when the drift was getting clearer or more, I had a I, I had a gap between the the, um, uh, the sensor head and the surface, and it came probably from the vibrations of the stepper motor that the thing has moved a little bit. So I'm I assume that this is not a really drift, but just an artifact resulting from my wobbly setup. Yeah. Okay. So I, I will keep an eye on that. Yeah. But I think not that this is a real problem. Okay. When you look at my screen, the experiment that you did there for that wave there, what was the distance that you were measuring? Was that from zero to five centimeters? Or yes, in, 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 the, in the latest setup, where which is also presented in the videos, it was from uh, zero to five centimeters. You can get even a, a few millimeters further, but um, uh, in this region, uh, the more distance there is, then the, the, the uh, then it flattens on top. Yeah. Then, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's, now going, based so it's not completely linear. It's it's going a little bit like going in a saturation. It's it's the same what we have seen in the video from Clement Vishko Vish. Yeah. Okay, if that's a distance of zero to five centimeters, uh, yeah, we shouldn't have a problem getting reliable measurements with this. That is good. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it means that in the closer distance you get a clearer and better signal. Um, what, what is um, the distance, what you have in mind, or what you think by experience maybe what is uh, appropriate or which, uh, how much distance should we at least have between the uh, sensor head and the surface later in, in running the torch table when it's getting hot? Have you um, any value? Uh, five millimeters. Uh, how many? Five, five millimeters. So five millimeters is the closest distance uh, we could get. That is cool because uh, in this range we have, of course, the best signal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's what I'm but saying. We're gonna... I would estimate mm -hmm. from here um, I mean I don't know how much electrical noise the rest of the torch table is producing but here from my setup with an electrical stepper motor next to it uh, I have the feeling that we could even go up to 20 millimeters so I guess 5 millimeters up to 20 millimeters that will be our, our, our range but when you say 5 millimeters that means also Probably that is what we can expect, that the uh, plate, the, the iron plate, will be um, deforming if it's, it's get, getting hot. Is that right? Yeah, we're going to have a... Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go. No, this is great. Looks looks very positive for initial data. We're going we're gonna to work this out. This is good. And I'll see if I can get somebody to comment on this, someone who might be in the know about capacitive sensors. Okay, excellent work, man. Good job for the home team. Another score against global oppression. <laughs> okay, uh, very good. So we can, I think we, we want to wrap up the meeting. It's a good two hours. So, um, yeah. 
I think uh, good progress and uh, we'll continue working on a 3d print cluster so uh, I think I'll call it call it here does anyone else have any other comments or questions at this time well if I if I can help you in anything just tell me Who was that speaking? Sorry. Was it Alejandro? Hey, hi, Martin. Yes, yeah. sir. Excellent. If I can help. Yep. Yeah. What? So, so what I'm. Just tell me. Okay. Okay. We should get you going on. Um, like immediately, we should start on the filament extruder stuff. And I don't know how much you you understood from that but maybe we can follow up so maybe we can let everybody go the only thing is I want to follow up with um, Christian as well Christian we're talking right now as well to do the print cluster work I need like half hour to, to relax for a second and then would you, are you still gonna be up Christian no problem okay I'll call you back in, in half an hour and as far as uh, as far as the meeting I, I just wanna so Alejandro maybe we can talk a little bit but otherwise let's um let's call this a day Thanks, everybody, and, and next meeting is, once again, 1 p.m. on Tuesday of next week, so we'll see how far we get till that time, and otherwise, great progress. We'll see you at that time, okay? Great. Um, okay. Excellent. Alejandro, uh, let me just ask you for a little bit. Um, how much of the conversation did you follow regarding the filament extruder work? Did that make sense to you, or...? Yeah, some things are... Uh, a little advanced to me, but mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to understand. I'm recording this conversation, and I'm review uh, later, and I'm trying to understand. But yeah. It's, it's... Right. What I what yeah. I would say, um, we want to do. See if you can go through the. Yeah. Yeah, just review the part about like what I'm I talk. Sorry, but yep. Disconnect the connection. The connection so sounds bad. But sounds I, bad. I don't, I don't know if it's my connection. Okay. Um. So. Let's let's have you do this. I mean, just oh, what I'm gonna do is. Sorry. Uh. Yeah. You know what, Roberto, if you want to get together with Alejandro, you guys speak the same language, so maybe maybe you can fill him in a little more on the details and maybe have him can you maybe have him take on a couple of simple tasks with you? Like you can guide him through that? Yes. That'll be great. I, I can. Yeah. Yes, if, please. Yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Hey, wait, so, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, yeah, I have a lot. Oh uh, yeah, so I'll introduce you to like I'll email you guys uh, right now, and you can then guide Alejandro on some of the specific tasks. Because you have a Roberto, you have a good good handle on what's what's going on there. So if you can have them step right into the simple task, there's a lot of simple tasks to be done there. So if you could do that. Yes, definitely. Yep. Okay, if you look at, if you see the chat, you see his um, email? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we'll connect you on email. And then, um, otherwise, thanks a lot, everybody. And we'll meet again next Tuesday, 1 p.m. CST. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye.